Hey everyone, it's Mark from Flight Sim School, and today we're going to be covering all the details of RNAV approaches in the PMDG 737, some of the limitations that you should be aware of, what you can and can't do, and we're going to start off by deciphering all the different terms that you might hear thrown around when it comes to RNAVs. I've done my best to try and understand all of the subtleties when it comes to RNAVs in the 737, but I'm by no means an expert. So if you notice anything that's not quite accurate, feel free to let me know in the comments, but I think it's just about right. All right, so there's a bunch of different ways that you can land the 737, from visual approaches to the tried and true ILS approach. And then there's a whole bunch of approaches that fall into the non-precision category, like VORs, NDBs, and the RNAVs that we're looking at today. RNAV approaches are split into two different subcategories, which have different names depending on where you are and where you're flying. But regardless of what it's called, the core difference between them really comes down to the equipment that you need to have on board to fly them. An RNAV GNSS or GPS approach is basically the same thing, and they're going to always have straight segments between all of the waypoints of the approach procedure, and it'll likely have a couple of different minimums listed on the chart as well, be it for LNAV, LNAV plus VNAV, or LP and LPV approaches, like this approach that we're looking at here in Toronto. Now the first thing to know is that the 737 doesn't have the equipment to fly LP or LPV approaches, so if you're flying this type of RNAV, you'll have to fly it either with the LNAV or the LNAV plus VNAV minimums, depending on what's available of course for the approach that you're flying. The other type of RNAV approach is an RNP or AR approach, depending on what you want to call it. And this can actually have curved segments on the approach, which are going to be called radius to fixed legs or just RF for short. And as you can guess, these can make for some pretty fun and interesting landings like this approach into Santos Dumont in Brazil with that last second turn towards final. The RNP or AR approach has two levels of accuracy. The first one's going to keep you within 0.3 miles of the center line of the approach, and it's going to be the same as what you'd get for a GPS GNSS approach. But what you can also do with an RNP approach is fly it down to 0.1 miles from the center line, which is a fair bit more accurate, and those allow for some really precise routes into and out of congested spaces, noise sensitive areas, etc. When it comes to the PMDG 737, it can technically get the accuracy needed for the 0.1 minimums, but it can still have some issues flying them, which we'll see in a second. So for that reason, when I'm doing an RNP approach, I'll usually stick to the 0.3 minimums. But in flight sim, at the end of the day, you can fly whatever you want. You'll just want to make sure that you're on your toes in case it can't fly the approach properly. Now there is still one catch though, and that has to do with those pesky RF legs that we were just talking about before. Because as of the time I'm recording this, the 737 can't actually fly RF legs directly. However, you can get around this in one of two different ways. The first option is obviously to just fly an RNP approach that doesn't require RF legs. For example, the approach we'll be flying into San Diego here requires RF on the segments that's coming in from the northwest and looping around. But since I'm going to be actually flying in from the other direction from the east, I'll still be able to fly the approach correctly anyways. The other thing is that you can also sort of fly RF legs today, even though it's not perfect. The way it's been implemented at the moment, it uses a bunch of intermediate waypoints to simulate the curve of the RF leg. And although it's not perfect, it does work well enough for legs that don't need to be ultra precise like this one does, because it's not really critical because it's not at the end of our approach. Although I probably wouldn't trust it if it's for a last second turn like we saw in Santos Dumo. RF legs are going to be coming hopefully soon to the 737 now that they've been announced as being part of the 777, but based on how conservative PMDG are with updates, it might still take a while to happen, but maybe by the time you're watching this, it'll be there and you can just disregard this part of the video. So with all of that out of the way, we can set everything up for our approach into San Diego. But before that, I want to remind you to like the video if you've learned something useful already and subscribe as well so you don't miss out on other similar videos to this one. All right, so I'm sitting at the gate right now and I started setting the plane up by importing the route from Simbrief. And I'll also have it in the description for you if you want to try this route out for yourself. And just so that we stay focused on the RNAV approach, I'm only going to cover the parts that are relevant to that here rather than going over absolutely everything. But if you need help with setting up the rest of the plane, you can always check out my full length FMC setup tutorial because it covers everything that you'll need to know. 
let's head over into the links page now and I'll switch it into plan mode just so we can review what we're doing with the navigation display. Our first waypoint after takeoff is to Zoo, which is going to take us just to the south of where we are. And then we're going to follow a couple of waypoints out to the edge of San Diego until we get to Top Gun. And at that point, we're going to turn north towards Juner, and then we'll turn back inbound towards the city after that. That's going to take us right up to Barrett. And then from there, you can see we don't have our approach loaded in yet. So we'll actually have to go pick that ourselves now. So I'll head into the departure arrivals menu for that. So we said we were going to be doing the Arnev Zulu to 27, which is the RNPAR approach. So we'll pick that from the list. It's just on the next page. And then for the transition, we're going to pick Lindy since that lines up pretty well with our route, although we could have just flown the final segment of the approach as well, and it would have worked too. I'll execute that. And from here, if we go back onto the lakes page, I'll change our view so we can see the ND again. And we can see all of our waypoints that the approach have been loaded in after Barrett. So we now have our complete route from takeoff all the way to landing. The only problem, though, is we have a discontinuity between Barrett and Lindy, but we can handle that pretty easily by just making our route go from one waypoint to the next because the two of them line up pretty nicely anyways. So what I'll do is load Lindy into the scratch pad We'll plug it in on top of the discontinuity. We'll confirm that change to get rid of discontinuity. And now that's going to give us a nice clean flight plan. Now, one thing that I always do at this point is compare the waypoints that I have on the approach chart to the ones that are actually loaded into the FMC. And you'll especially want to make sure that the altitudes match up with what you see in the FMC as well. For example, you can see it's put a hard altitude of 2,000 feet at Rebo for us, which basically from what I understand means that it's going to calculate the rest of the vertical profile so that once we reach that waypoint, it'll cross it at exactly 2,000 feet. The other thing to watch out for is the glide path to the runway from the final approach fix. The approach into San Diego is a little bit steeper than usual at about three and a half degrees and we can see it's loaded that in correctly so it should descend from Rebo down to the runway at the right glide path angle. That pretty much covers it for the route setup so I'll wrap up the rest of the details need to go into the FMC and I'll meet you in flight. Alright, so we're just about ready to start setting everything up for the approach. We're LNAVing level at 8,000 feet, and things are going to get really busy really fast, so let's get to it. The first thing we're going to set up here is the altimeter, which is ultra important for an RNAV approach because that's what the plane uses to calculate its altitude the whole way down to the ground, so it's really important to have that set up correctly. I've already got it set to the right value because I literally just took off from San Diego so there's nothing for me to adjust here but if you were flying a full flight you could always get it very easily by just going into the EFB and then checking the information under the arrival section and it'll be right there. To be honest though, I am a little bit lazy when it comes to setting the altimeter. Most of the time I just press the B key to make sure that it's set properly rather than going to figure it out and then setting it with the dial. But obviously this is going to be a personal preference thing and you might prefer to do it the real way and that's totally fine. Next up, we're going to do a little bit of setup in the FMC. We'll go to the init page to set up our approach flaps. I'm actually going to use flaps 40 today because of that three and a half degree descent on the final approach segment. It should help us to be a little bit slower and we'll be able to come to a stop a little bit faster once we're on the ground. That's going to give us a VREF of 136 knots for final approach. So that'll cover it for everything we need to do here. And now we can go back to the legs page to check a couple more details. Right at the bottom of this page, you can see there's two values. The RNP number is the required navigation performance that we need for the approach. And that relates back to the RNP precision that we originally saw when we were looking at the chart. And right next to that, we have the actual navigation performance that we're currently getting from the airplane. We're going to do the 0.3 rather than the 0.1 for the reasons we mentioned earlier. So I'll plug 0.3 into the scratch pad. And then I'll load that in by pressing the key right next to the RNP field. 
And what that's going to do for us is if for whatever reason the airplane can't get the required accuracy, we'll get a message on the FMC warning us of it to be able to stop the approach. However, I've never actually seen that happen in the PMDG 737 and I don't think it actually can. That covers it for the FMC and next we are going to drop our altitude down to the MDA for the approach. That's 778 feet, so I'll actually send it to the nearest 100, which is going to be 800. And like that, the plane will be able to descend all the way down to our minimums without needing us to intervene again. From what I understand, different operators have different ways of doing things with regards to setting the AP altitude as you're starting the approach. So if you prefer to do it another way and maybe just drop the altitude a bit by bit as you're going, that's totally fine as well. I just find this approach is a little bit more convenient for me and I don't have to worry about forgetting to dial my altitude down again. We'll also set our minimums now as well to the same altitude and for an RNAV approach you're going to want to use the barrow mins to make sure it's going to give you a call out at the correct altitude as well. The last check I usually do at this point is to bring up the default rings on the ND if they aren't up already so that I can visually get an idea of how far out I am just at a quick glance. And the last thing I have to do here is make sure that we are in VNAV because that is what's going to allow us to fly the approach properly. Okay, we're just coming up on our top of descent point and as we go by it, there's going to be new symbols that'll come up on the PFD and the ND that are there to tell us how we're tracking relative to the ideal vertical path for the approach. It uses the approach information that we were looking at earlier in the FMC to calculate the glide path all the way down to the runway and the vertical deviation indicator that's at the bottom right of the ND gives you a visual cue as to where you are relative to that vertical path. Although the display looks and works like a glide slope, it's entirely calculated from the FMC, so it's actually a glide path instead. And what the plane does is it prioritizes following that profile over everything else, which is why we're just a tad below the profile right now. But say if we had started off way above the profile, it would increase our vertical speed automatically to catch it. Just to be safe though, you should keep an eye on how you're tracking as you continue to descend. And if you see it struggling to catch up, you could always extend the speed brakes to help it out a little bit. But the only situation that I've really needed to intervene to help it out is if I accidentally overflew the top of the send point by a fair bit and I was really high on profile. Now as we come up on the decel point, you're going to have a choice here to either let the plane handle your airspeed completely for you with VNAV, which works pretty well from the few times that I've tried it, but more commonly I've noticed real pilots will open up the speed intervent window at this point to control the airspeed more closely themselves. We're supposed to cross the Lindy at 210 knots, so I've dialed my speed back to that. And once we go by the decel point, it'll start slowing down to that speed for us. But you'll still want to keep an eye on the FMC for a drag required message, just in case you need to give it a bit of help with the speed brakes. We're coming up on our initial approach fix now, so it's going to be time to start configuring for the approach. And the way I do it is in three steps, working backwards from the final approach fix, because that's the point where I want to be fully configured so that I can fly that final segment down to the runway in a stable config. What that actually means is I'll usually go to flaps one when I get to the initial approach fix. So as we're going to be crossing Lindy here, and then once we're about halfway to the final approach fix at Rebo, I'll slow to the flaps 10 speed, which is as far as you can go without setting the gear horn off. And then once I'm just outside the final approach fix is where I'll go flaps full and bring the gear out. Okay, we're turning towards the final approach course now, so I'll bring the speed down again to 166 knots this time, so it matches our second to last waypoint of the approach. And I'll bring the flaps to 10 now as well to help slow us down, although I probably should have waited just a second longer since we were really close to the max extension speed for them. One thing you might have noticed so far is that an RNAV approach has a lot less setup than a full ILS approach and we don't have to set our course or enable the approach mode at all so it saves you a little bit of work. However, if you're flying into really low level clouds and there is an ILS approach available, you'll still want to pick that one because it'll give you a slightly lower decision altitude. And since we've got a bit of time here before things get busy on short final, we'll do a few last setup things. 
So we'll turn our continuous ignition for boat engines to on. The landing lights can also come on. We'll give ourselves auto brake three to help out on landing because it is a long runway, but we are coming in at that steep angle. And lastly, and very importantly, don't forget to arm the speed brakes so they extend on touchdown automatically for you. We're coming up on just a few miles to the final approach fix, so we can go gear down now. And I'll also tell the plane to slow to VREF plus 10 for the approach, so around 146 knots. And we'll also set our flaps to 40 so that we're all set up for the last dash down to the runway. As we go past the final approach fix, the plane's going to start pitching down to that three and a half degree slope. And it is actually a good time to start looking for the runway if you're waiting to break out of the clouds. The next thing that we can do once we're more than 300 feet past the final approach fix is set our AP altitude to the missed approach altitude. And like that, the plane's going to continue descending normally and we'll be all set up for the go around in case we need it. At this point, we can continue to ride the autopilot all the way down to our minimums at 800 feet, at which point we do have to turn it off and land it ourselves. There's no auto land for an RNAV approach. I would personally normally disable it a little bit before that because I like to have a little bit of fun landing on short final. I'm leaving it on a little bit longer here for the tutorial, but it's really up to you to decide when you feel comfortable to turn the autopilot off. The approach into San Diego is a bit tricky because not only does it have that three and a half degree glide path, but because the ground slopes down and away from you, it gives a really weird effect where one second it feels like you're too low and then the next one it feels like you're just too high. From here though, it's just like a normal landing in the 737 and you'll want to only have a very light flare and it should settle down pretty nicely for you. I hope you learned a thing or two about Arnaz during this video. If you did, please make sure to like the video and subscribe as well so that you don't miss out on the next one.